Okay, welcome back everyone. And uh, this is the course on fundamental uh, topics in bioethics and within the program of the Masters in Bioethics here at St. Thomas University. And uh, today we're going to be talking about adaptiveness. adaptiveness. Okay, so we'll begin always with a little prayer in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in us the fire of your divine love. O Lord, send forth your spirit and we shall be recreated and you shall be new the faith of the earth. Amen. Today is the memorial of St. Martin the Forest, a saint in Lima, Peru, in the 16th century, who gives us a great example of faith, hope, and charity, so we ask for his intercession. Martin the Porris. Okay. Any questions or comments from the previous lectures or anything in between? No? All right. So we go forward now. And we had looked off last time with selection. We had looked at the different types of selection. First, artificial selection. Okay, let me see, one of you has the microphone on in the background. Let me see who it is. Yes, okay. Uh, Father Roberto, if you don't mind muting your microphone, the microphone part, because we can hear your noise background. Okay, I need to do that. Yeah, just mute it, and when you want to speak, uh, say something, then you can enable it, all right? Otherwise, we hear all the noise in the background. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. That's fine. See how Drissel has it uh, mute here. There you go. Okay, excellent. So, whenever you want to say anything, just uh, enable it, okay? Great. Here we go. Yes, so we were looking at uh, selection last time, right? And I was mentioning that one of the things that triggered Darwin to think about uh, a process, a mechanism for evolution for this um, constant variety of uh, species that is found throughout the world is artificial selection. In other words, that we humans have been engaged in artificial selection for centuries and millennia. Mm -hmm. the domestication of animals and plants. Uh, typically, it was for food, for getting larger products, larger uh, yield of crops, and then also bigger animals, domesticated animals, or stronger, and so forth. And, and then it spilled over into the pet industry, if you will, by domesticating animals to the point of having them uh, at home. But this whole issue of artificial selection gave him the idea that nature is perhaps doing the same, but it's a much longer period of time because uh, what is one of the main differences between artificial selection and natural selection with regards to the choosing of the trait, the, the trait itself, the characteristic that for example, we humans choose uh, to enhance, let's say in fruit trees, which are wild originally, right? And as we domesticate them, as we enhance, what do we enhance of the fruit tree? The fruit, the fruit, we want a bigger fruit, right? A tastier fruit and so forth. So is that done by chance or on purpose? On purpose, so we select on purpose right, in artificial selection. Whereas in nature, nature doesn't select for a bigger fruit, <laughs> right? It's a chance occurrence. And that's why the wild fruit is tiny because that's tiny for us because that's the size that is necessary for maintaining the seed. In other words, in nature, we understand that the fruit part of, of the plant it's just to provide nourishment, the initial nourishment of the seed. And that small amount of um, almidon, of starch, that is in wild fruits, 
is sufficient for getting that seed started by the time it puts out its first leaves and then begins to photosynthesize and therefore feed itself, okay? So in the wild, uh, fruits don't need a lot of starch. They don't need to be that large because it's only a little tiny amount of food that the seed needs at first to get it started. Or even to attract an animal to eat the fruit and then drop that seed somewhere else, dispersal. And so in fact, while uh, thinking out loud here, uh, wild fruits want to be small because a lot, who's, what bird is gonna eat a large apple, right? <laughs> but if it's a small apple, then a bird or a wild animal can eat it and digest it, but the seed will go through the digestive tract and then be dropped, even with the droppings will serve as fertilizer for the seed. So you see how it's all worked out. It, it works out in nature, but that is essentially by chance that it comes about. It's not directed, it's not oriented, all right? It's not pre-selected. So selection is, uh, is always uh, as a consequence or adaptation is a consequence of, of uh, the selecting process. But it's not chosen beforehand and that's a, a fundamental distinction between natural selection and artificial selection. But the fact that we select, right, gave Darwin the idea of this natural selection. Nature also selects, and maybe selection is not the best word because selection kind of implies that there is a choice, whereas it happens naturally, happens uh, by chance really. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's the word that he came up with and it's stuck. So that's what we have to deal with. But we have to take away the directedness out of natural selection, all right? But then when we get to sexual selection, we're back to, to choosing, <laughs> all right? Because in sexual selection, there is a choice. There is a mate choice. Typically, it's the female that chooses on the male, uh, but the male also indirectly because of the competition that occurs in nature, all right? And then some species, uh, uh, prominently the human species, their selection on both the male and the female, or by both, I should say. But natural selection, which excludes sexual, and that's one of the main differences, again, between natural and sexual selection, even though they both occur naturally, is that natural selection is not oriented. It happens by chance, by, in other words, within the variation, this particular variety, this particular variant is a little better adapted at this particular conditions than the probability that that variant will find a mate or will get to reproductive success and so forth is enhanced because of that particular trait or that set of traits that are happening in that variant at this particular time with these environmental conditions, okay? All right, so um, one point about uh, natural selection in general is the slowness, how it occurs so slowly precisely because it is such a, uh, a random event mm -hmm, that we had left with a question here. Yes, why is evolution so slow, right? Well, because uh, it has to, it's by chance when the variant happens to arise, that is favored by the environmental conditions of the time, then that gets to pass on if that variant gets to reproductive success, meaning finding a mate and then uh, producing fertile offspring. So remember, it's a double step, right? And it happens in animals and in plants also, even though the plants don't move around much, but their gametes, the male gamete does move around a lot. The male gamete in plants typically is what? The male gamete in plants is typically pollen, pollen, right? And that flies out a lot, okay? So that does migrate, migrates to where the female gamete is, the egg or the ovule within the pistil of the flower or inside the cone if it's going to be a pine tree. All right, so precisely because it is a chance event, it is typically slow. And it also bespeaks of the, uh, the climate that generally the climate is more or less stable, right? 
over long period of time. And that's another difference between weather and climate. People confuse weather and climate. Weather is the daily weather that we have. The, the, the variation in temperature, humidity, light, and so forth, that happens on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Climate is typically measured in millions of years or hundreds of thousands of years. We want to scale it down to tens of thousands of years, all right? But that's already getting small scale for climate. It's long term. So you can see it's accumulation. It's a huge accumulation of weather data that makes the climate. But when we talk about climate change, we have to be careful because there's weather change all the time. And there's seasonal change every year. You know, what's the most drastic weather change that we don't realize? It's so obvious and it's so drastic. It's like hiding in plain sight, like they say, hiding in plain sight. What is the most drastic weather change that happens daily? And it affects nature. Yes. Global warming? No, not global warming. Not global warming at all. Sun or no sun. Sun or no sun. Day or light. It makes a big difference in our lives and the lives of all of nature. Photosynthesis, no photosynthesis. Activity, sleeping. <laughs> you know, it's drastic. It has a drastic impact on behavior, on animal and plant behavior. Daily, every 24 hours, day and night, on average half and half, more or less. You know, tomorrow we're going back to daylight savings time, or back to normal time, whatever it is. We fall back tomorrow, right? Okay. So uh, we gain one hour of sleep tomorrow. <laughs> what we lost <laughs> four months ago. <laughs> yes, so you see, uh, that's weather. Then on top of that, did it rain, did it not rain? Was it hot, cold, etc.? All the other environmental factors, the abiotic factors that make up the, the weather, right? But that changes daily. Whereas climate is very long term. Hmm? Emma, had a question? Yes. yes. Uh, what about in Nebraska where it's like half of the year is darkness and then light? Yes. How do they uh, adapt to that weather like that? And how do exactly. How species go back so large? Exactly. That's within the two circles, the, actor, the Arctic Circle in the Antarctic Circle, which is at the poles, what we call the poles, the North and South Pole, right? It's very drastic, the, the uh, lack of uh, or the change from daylight to uh, day to night is very drastic because half of the month, practically the sun doesn't set. It comes down to the horizon and then it rises again because the angle it's, uh, it's so drastic for the sun there, right? And then the other half, the sun is like it never comes out. <laughs> it's in darkness. And at most, they get a penumbra, right? They get a, a, a little bit like a dawn, a little bit of diffuse light, but it's not the actual sun for the other six months of the year. And it happens on both sides at opposite times, right? When it's winter on one side, it's summer on the other hemisphere and vice versa. So the animals and plants that live there are adapted to that. First of all, let me take back the word plants, because at the top of the North Pole, what do we have? We have an ice cap, right? Which is basically a huge ice cube because it's, hot, it's water underneath. We'll get to that in the, in the environmental course. But at the South Pole, there is actually a continent, which is called Antarctica, Antarctica. right? The South Pole. But that's also ice on the top. So how many plants are growing there? Like zero, <laughs> okay? Now, there will be microscopic uh, algae and um, protists that can survive, but mostly in the liquid water phase, not in the ice, right? But there are animals that live there. So those animals are adapted, and typically, what do they do in the winter? They hibernate, exactly. Their metabolism slows down to a basic minimum and they hibernate. So they take this long six months sleep. <laughs> and then for the other six months, they're more or less active, you know, but still they're pretty slow, at least the ones who live on the land, which are mostly what? The bear, the, the polar bear, right? And in Antarctica, it's mostly penguins. <laughs> Then the water is a different environment because now you got in the oceans, you got liquid water. And so you do have an active phase going on there. But still, it's going to be seasonal also. And there's a lot of migration in and out 
So it's basically, bottom line, it's a fairly inhospitable environment, the two poles, right, for life as we know it, because it's so extreme and the body internally needs liquid water for metabolizing and all that. So kind of a roundabout question, but the bottom line is really today's lecture, those animals that live there are adapted to that environment. Okay, so I, I'm just picking up here that uh, we concluded last time that it seems for us that evolution is so slow because it's two different time scales. What time scales are we talking about? Well, I'm talking about the uh, evolutionary time scale, which is kind of parallel to what we call the geological time scale, which is measured in thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of years as opposed to the human scale, the lifespan of humans, which is about 80 years old, as the Bible says, 70 or 80 for those who are strong, <laughs> right? <laughs> so when we compare our lifespan to the geologic time or the evolutionary time scale, there are two different scales. You know, we want, it, we want to see it now. We want to see it fast, <laughs> basically, because in a few years, we're gone. <laughs> but it doesn't work like that. Okay, uh, nature does not respond to us. We respond to nature or not. <laughs> so, but I want to pick up here on this word adapted because we took it for granted. You know, we look out the window. I always talk about looking out the window or going through the wall here, looking outside at nature. And what do we see? We see kind of a stability. We see a balance. We see a harmony there plants and animals and fungi, and then what we don't see that is also there are the bacteria and all this. They're, they are living in a harmony, in a cycle that seems very well adapted, very stable, all right? Unless there is some kind of a drastic what? Change. Climatological change. And not just drastic weather change, because we have drastic weather change every day. Those guys out there, they're adapted to that, right? But climatological change. So now I bump the scale back up to the thousands or millions of years. Then we'll see some, perhaps, the possibility of speciation, the variants that were better adapted. So you see why we're building first, we did variation, quantitative traits, and now uh, the mechanism of natural selection now we're going to move into adaptiveness. We're going to look at what is this adaptation, right? Which is Meyer's uh, chapter seven. I don't know if you had a chance to read it, but basically this is like a little summary of what I gave you. And this is what we're covering today, okay? So let's go forward. Uh, Meyer at the beginning of the chapter makes the point that the word Adaptation is uh, kind of unfortunate because it has, first of all, it's defined in many, many different ways, but the one aspect uh, of adaptation that is that the animal or plant or the organism, the living species, adapts to the environment kind of actively. And that is an erroneous concept, right? Because that would be what we call Lamarckian. Remember Lamarck, uh, Jean Baptiste de Lamarck, who said that uh, the classical example is the example of the giraffe. How did the giraffe get the long neck? By trying to reach uh, the higher leaves of the acacia trees in the, in the African savanna. And the leaves kept getting higher and higher because the shorter giraffes ate the shorter leaves, the lower leaves, and so the the giraffe has to stretch out its neck, and it, it, it kind of appeals, you know, it appeals to something that we want to believe, but it doesn't happen, right? That is what is called the inheritance of acquired characteristics. It's like a little catchphrase, inheritance of acquired characteristics. Let me, uh, how about I open a little document here? write some words 
I put it in quotations. More small. Let's move it over. And a little further down. <laughs> right? This is a little catchphrase. But uh, this would be Lamarckian. Double R. Double M. It's embarrassing. I forget if it's single M or double M. <laughs> no mark. One. Single M. Okay. Just Google it. The new verb. Google. <laughs> Google it. In Spanish also. Googleero. <laughs> Say in Spanish. <laughs> Incredible. What we have in our pockets today is just unbelievable. All right, so this little catchphrase, it, it, it kind of appeals to us, right, that the uh, animals and plants, they adapt to the environment, and that's why they're so successful and so forth, and the one that adapts better is the most successful one. But this is totally erroneous, okay? Why? Because this would mean that the taller giraffe, or the giraffe that stretched its neck tallest, was able to pass that longer neck trait, that longer neck gene, to the next generation, to the baby giraffes, all right? But there is no longer neck gene. In other words, we don't manufacture genes as we live. I'll give you another example that is closer to us as humans. They say bodybuilders, you know, they're pumping iron, right? You see this bodybuilders, a whole culture about it, and contests and all this. You see this guys walking around, they look like hulks with all this muscle. Were they born that way? No. They were born like you and I, normal human beings, all right, and they grew and so forth. And in fact, if they had never exercised or, or eaten very little, they would become emaciated and would, they would be like skin and bone, like we talk about, right? Because of uh, muscle waste uh, and, uh, and uh, self-digestion of the muscle and so forth. But they went the other route, they started doing a lot of exercise, eating a lot of protein, etc., cetera, uh, eating a dozen eggs a day, <laughs> things like this, without the, without the uh, yolk, just a source of protein. Anyway, so now they're bodybuilders. If they marry and have children, do you think that that bodybuilder, their children, are going to be born like that, all husky? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. They're going to be born just like the rest of us born, all right? And if that child does not do bodybuilding, that child will not become a bodybuilder, will not look like his dad, <laughs> hmm? you see? Because the dad, the father, who did all the effort to build his muscles, right? There's no way that he could uh, change his uh, genome, or his, rather his genotype to kind of impregnate his genotype with the bigger muscles. And, and Meyer makes that point that the genome is immune, is uh, sealed literally, you know, the nucleus activity is a one-way street. The nuclear, the, the uh, DNA information, the inheritance information, and the nucleus goes out of the nucleus, does not come into the nucleus. The only time that it kind of comes into the nucleus, there's once and only one chance that the nucleus has an opportunity to uh, receive DNA information, genetic information. It happens once, and I'll give you a hint, it happens at the beginning of our existence, which is? Of yeah, for the session, exactly. The, when the two pronuclei fuse into a diploid nucleus. That's the only one time that the nucleus has the opportunity to acquire or to inherit uh, characteristics, okay? Which is the fertilization process at the nuclear level, which we'll talk about in more detail in the next uh, semester, actually, in the beginning of life course, all right? So you see, then from then on, that genome is fixed 
or the genotype is fixed for each one of us with the traits and potential traits that we all have. But whether those traits are developed or not, it's up to each one of us. So just like this fellow Joe became that bodybuilder, any one of us could become bodybuilders also if we do the same that, that he did. But if we don't, we don't. <laughs> In other words, the potential is there. That's it, our genotype, okay? But the characteristics that we acquire through life, that we develop through life, do not become inherited except in some bacteria or because of a number of a couple of reasons uh, one reason being that they don't really have a nucleus that's why they prokaryotes right and not eukaryotes because bacteria their genetic material is not sealed in a double membrane so it's more exposed to possible mutations or inference and in fact there's a technique it's called lateral gene transfer and that's how one bacterium can influence the genome of another bacterium or the genotype of another bacterium by this lateral gene transfer. But beyond that, forget it. Once we get to the eukaryote cell, in other words, to the true nucleus, a sealed uh, DNA uh, genotype, then the only thing that could influence that is typically some, uh, some um, insult, some offense, which will cause a mutation, right? Which would be ultraviolet radiation or heat, like we saw, or certain chemicals, like we saw earlier, the, the mutation. Mm -hmm. Okay, but there's no inheritance. Uh, mm -hmm. This is false in nature on this planet at least <laughs> we can say that this on this planet the way the system works in nature this is false okay so when we say that an organism the organisms are perfectly adapted to their current environment when we look at the window we have to qualify that adapted it doesn't mean that the organism that the most fit is passing those characteristics that were acquired through in the lifetime to the next generation. And so it's not an active process. This adaptation is not active, it's post facto. He makes the point and he actually uses the, the Latin terminology from last century, you know, a posteriori, he says. Uh, adaptation, rather, is an, uh, Posteriori event. A posteriori means after the fact. In other words, once we look at the window and we see they are already adapted. They are already adapted. And so that's why Mayo proposes a change in the word to adaptedness. All right? The capacity, adaptedness makes it more passive, you see? The capacity for adaptation. I'm sorry, maybe, should I do this? Or is that too dark? For the better, or you tell me? Is that enough? Yeah, give it a try. Okay, so uh, let's get a little more into it and you'll see uh, what I mean uh, as we go along. We see that all these different organisms seem to be perfectly adapted to their environment, but that perfectly is not quite so. They just seem that way to us, okay? But there are gonna be restrictions and constraints in their adaptation that we don't realize because we see them functioning perfectly well and living and thriving and so forth. So let's look at some adaptations. For example, fish, gills right fish have managed to get oxygen gas out of water out of liquid water which is pretty amazing <laughs> okay think about this for a moment here we have liquid water and that water may be oxygenated or not 
I mean, the extreme example of oxygenated water is what? Hydrogen peroxide, right? Which is unstable. <laughs> H2O2, that second O doesn't want to be there. It's excess. <laughs> and so when normal is in contact with the air, that second O tends to leave. <laughs> All right? Uh, so, but H2O also, which is a stable molecule, and as we know, it's polar. We're going to talk about that um, a little more in detail in the environmental course. But basically, water is like a little magnet. And gases dissolve in water. A number of gases dissolve in water. All right. One of the gases that dissolves in water is oxygen, oxygen, diatomic oxygen. In other words, O2, two atoms of oxygen that are stable together. It's called diatomic. That is a gas, and that is what we're breathing right now in the atmosphere. It's about, what, about 16%, you said? About 16% of the atmosphere that we're breathing, of the air that we're breathing right now. The bulk of the air that we're breathing right now is another gas. Which other gas? CO2. Well, CO2 is very tiny amount. What is the bulk of the gas that we're breathing in and out of our lungs right now? Oxygen. Nitrogen, nitrogen. N2, diatomic nitrogen, which at this temperature is a gas, right? And it's about three-fourths of the, at of, the, of the atmosphere that we're breathing, of the air that we're breathing, is nitrogen. <coughs> and what do we do with that nitrogen? Nothing. It comes in and out of our lungs, and it's what we call inert. It's an inert gas. In other words, it comes in and out of our lungs, and we don't do anything with it. Thank God, because if we start absorbing nitrogen gas, we can get what is known as nitrogen narcosis, right? It makes us like drunk. And that's what happens in diving, in scuba diving. Mm -hmm. So it's a good thing that nitrogen at this temperature and pressure is inert. First, it's in the gas form. Secondly, it just comes in and out of our lungs, and we don't worry about it. But oxygen is uh, necessary for life. And so that fraction of the air that is oxygen when it comes into our lungs, the RBCs capture it through a process very similar to this, only that our uh, environment in the lungs, well, it's also a liquid environment because of the surfactant and the, the, uh, the humidity of the alveoli, they have to be humid so they don't collapse, right? And for the absorption of oxygen to occur. So really at the microscopic level, we're doing essentially the same that the gills are doing, functionally the same, we're absorbing oxygen and releasing CO2 into the environment of the lungs. And then by exhaling, that air from the lungs comes out and we get new air and so forth. But functionally, the gills do the same, only that they do it in a liquid environment where the percentage of oxygen is much smaller than the percentage of oxygen in air. Now, keep in mind, they're both fluids, right? Water, liquid water is obviously a fluid. It flows, we can pour it, but air is also a fluid. It's a fluid that, um, that we don't see, but it's definitely fluid. Mm -hmm. And it offers some resistance. If you move your hand fast enough, it offers, you can feel some resistance of, of the air, right? As we cut through the fluid. At any rate, there is oxygen, diatomic oxygen, gas, that is dissolved in the water molecule, in the liquid water, all right? And that is what the gills absorb, because you see there's a gradient. And let's say there is 100%, this is saturation, 100% saturation here of oxygen in water, in liquid water. But the gradient of uh, oxygen saturation in the blood of the gill is smaller. So it's by simple diffusion from a high concentration to a lower concentration of oxygen, not water, oxygen, okay? And so when we look at the percentage of oxygen in water, just outside the gills, outside the capillary, between the venous blood and the arterial blood of the fish, of the gill, at the gill level, at the capillary level, you'll see 
that there is always a smaller percentage of oxygen through the capillary than the percentage of oxygen in the surrounding water. And so by simple diffusion, that oxygen is going to move from a lower concentration to a higher concentration. Bottom line, functionally, what does that mean? That means that this capillary, the blood that is moving through that capillary, one way from venous blood, from veins to arteries, right, is picking up oxygen as it moves through passively. But of course, this is percentage saturation. Overall percentage, if we compare oxygen to water, there's gonna be much more water than oxygen. And therefore, to compensate for the little amount of oxygen there is compared to the large volume of water there is in, in, in the water that, where the fish is living, then the fish has thousands or maybe millions of capillaries in the gill system. Many, many capillaries in the gill system, okay? And that's also why the gills are so reddish and they're featherly-like, right? They're filament-like because each one of these gill filament is full of capillaries, jam-packed full of capillaries. See it? Look at that. And so when you start adding up the surface area of each one of these capillaries, it's something equivalent, I don't know, I'm just guessing, but it would be equivalent to covering perhaps this whole room, just from the surface areas of each one of those capillaries. All right, so what do we have? And yet, and then we can do an analysis. There's a question in the, uh, give me a minute, because someone is asking a question in the chat. <laughs> Give me a minute. Oh. Sorry about that, okay, go ahead. Don't worry, log off, don't worry, Giselle, take care of uh, your husband, <laughs> I just had surgery, all right. Thank you. Sure, sure, no problem, go ahead, go ahead. Priorities, okay. So, what do we have? If we were to do the same with a, with a lung, let's say the lung of an animal that would be the size of the fish, right, because we have to compare try to compare as much apples with apples. <laughs> we were to take an animal, let's say a small mammal that would be about the same body mass as a fish. Why do I make that comparison? Because, you know, what is the oxygen doing? The oxygen is maintaining this body mass alive. So we're trying to equate, you know, if we were to say, okay, we'll take our lungs and spread them on this room and see, what kind of surface areas we get with our viola. Well, then we'd have to consider a fish that is our size also, more or less, or at least the same weight, more or less, outside of water, because in the water they weigh less. <laughs> Talking about body mass, maintaining the tissue alive. All right, so functionally, remember this little phrase, always think functionally. We want to compare it as close as possible. Uh, if we were to take, so let's take a fish that, were, that would have our body mass, for example, one of those uh, Jew fish groupers uh, that can weigh 150 pounds. <laughs> All right, and we were to take our lung and the alve alveoli and spread out the surface area. I know there's a number to that. I can't remember what it is. I don't know if I you remember, but it would separately, it would probably cover this room. You know, the surface area of this room, it would just spread out the alveoli, the, the capillary surface area. And it would be functionally equivalent, right? It would be about the same surface area than the surface area of the capillaries, of the gills, of a fish that would be about our size. So functionally, it's doing the same. You see? But it would be a functional equivalent. Why? Because Again, backtrack a little bit on my thought. Uh, the gill surface area is actually going to be larger because what's your intuition? Where is there more oxygen? In water, even oxygenated water, okay? Water or air? Air. Oh, yeah. We have about 16%. I don't know exactly what it is in water. A percentage air in water. Let's see. Let's see for a moment, just out of curiosity. Uh, Perception oxygen in water. 
average. 21. Oxygen concentration are much higher in air, which is about, oh, 21%. I was wrong. I was thinking 16. Uh, in water, it's about 1%. Look at that. So it's 1 20th, right? Therefore, by analogy, then the surface area of the capillaries of the gill should be 20 times larger than the surface area of an equivalent body mass of a lung. Mm -hmm. 20 times larger surface area. Yeah, and that's why those gills are so dense with capillaries and they're so red and they're relatively large compared to the body mass of, of the uh, fish. Okay, but anyway, it would seem like a perfect adaptation. Right? Here is a mechanism or a structure that allows an animal to live underwater. Now you try living underwater, see how long you last underwater, about a minute, right? We hold our breath for about a minute. <laughs> so that's uh, spectacular. And actually the adaptation was not them, the adaptation was us. In other words, we believe that life started first in the oceans and then migrated to land. So the adaptation is the long. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, so the whole point here is that the fish seems to be perfectly adapted to living in water, mostly by the gill mechanism. The rest, you know, the digestive tract is going to be more similar to ours. Uh, and um, the, even the skeleton being a vertebrate with vertebrae, articulated skeleton and so forth, internal skeleton, muscle system, more or less similar to ours. Of course, the locomotion is different. Mm -hmm. The, the structures of locomotion is different because it's moving through a thicker, uh, thicker medium, fluid. But the most drastic difference is going to be in the aeration of uh, the blood, the oxygenation of the blood, gills compared to lungs. Then, uh, how about flight? It's another spectacular adaptation, right? That uh, a number of uh, Mammal, a number of vertebrates have adapted to flight. The birds, which now from phylogenetics, uh, they're telling us that they are a derivative of the reptiles. In other words, they have a common ancestry more directly linked to uh, reptiles. But you can see that a contemporary bird and a contemporary reptile look very, very different today. It takes a little imagination to consider a feather, a super sophisticated, it's kind of a combination between a hair and, and a scale, all right? But in other words, that's the origin because it's a carotene, protein, and so forth, but that's the, it takes a little bit of imagination to see a feather developing out of the combination between hair and, and scale. <laughs> But the, the birds have uh, very interesting and spectacular adaptations. They are, like we say, they can be super adapted to be able to fly or to move, to, to glide through the other medium, the other fluid, which is air. So they're doing kind of functionally similar to the fish in moving through the medium, being buoyant in a fluid medium. But this time it's air instead of water, which is much less thick much less dense, and therefore they need very special adaptations. What is uh, the big no-no for birds is going to be weight. Weight works against them, whereas in the fish, who cares about weight? Look at whales, right, which are not fish, but they're marine mammals, and they are the largest animals by mass on Earth. Uh, so weight doesn't really matter that much in the ocean, in the water, but for flight, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, a huge impediment. So they have adapted to the point of having practically hollow bones with just a network of, um, of um, calcification, but they're basically hollow, so they're very light. They're not as dense as the terrestrial bones, even of vertebrates or, or uh, uh, mammals, okay? 
And obviously the four limbs, the forward limbs, F-O-R-E, Here are the forward appendages, right? You know, it's their arms. And in um, birds, their wings. So super adaptation of the forward appendages. They also have a disproportionately larger skull to the rest of the body because they need a relatively larger brain mostly to process the whole information about flight. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and their eyes are disproportionately larger, disproportionate to the rest of the body. Uh, because again, the main sense that is picking up the information for flight is the eye and that that's being processed through the brain. But also the, no the nostril keeps them, especially when they fly information, it is the smell of the other birds. It's the, it's the smell of the main bird that is keeping that V shape. <laughs> As, as its scent dissipates through the air, it forms a V shape, and that's how the others stay aligned. They finally figure out why the migrant birds fly in a V shape. <laughs> yes, uh, Emma. Um, does the bald eagle hunt for fish? Um, yeah, he can. Yes, they're good hunters. I've seen them. Um, uh, I've seen them in the Everglades actually do some canoe uh, paddling and, and canoe camping on the Everglades, the southern tip of the Everglades at uh, one time, and we saw bald eagles. The bald eagle is coming back, actually, to the point that it's not, uh, uh, it's not endangered or anything like that. It's protected. It's a national bird, and it's protected. Most birds in the United States are protected by law, but it's thriving. It's doing very well. So it can, be, it can fish also. So it can go terrestrial or marine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK. Now, there are certain disadvantages, and so they're not as perfectly adapted as one would think. A disadvantage of uh, hollow bones is, is that they tend to be brittle and they can break easily, right? And so there are disadvantages. For reptiles, because they are cold-blooded, meaning that they, their ectotherms is better ectotherm, as opposed to uh, endotherms. In other words, they take their temperature from the environment. This is the temperature that is uh, temperature. Is the temperature is a result of metabolism, right? Of oxidation and uh, cellular respiration, which produces heat as a byproduct. And because of our hair, we tend to hold on to our temperatures, mostly because of the hair. It forms a little veneer of heat around our bodies. And that's why a breeze cools us off, because it displaces a veneer of warm air that we have around our bodies. And clothing does functionally the same. It holds on to that heat that naturally dissipates through, uh, through the body and through the skin. Birds also, because of their uh, feather cover, are endotherms, whereas reptiles and amphibians, they, don't, they lack the structure necessary to hold on to that veneer of air around our, our bodies. And so they're ectotherms. In other words, they uh, they lose their internal body heat, and therefore they have to go out to sun themselves, sunny, all right? Which has several advantages. It also gets rid of uh, humidity, uh, especially in the aquatic reptiles, and so it cuts down on the growth of uh, fungi and bacteria on their uh, skin, right? But then that has a disadvantage, which is greater exposure to UV because sometimes they'll sun themselves for hours and they're being exposed to UV all that time, which is causing mutation. So 
What has happened? They have developed thicker skin, literally thicker skin, and also the scales, which uh, are a protection from the ultraviolet, some protection from ultraviolet, uh, but it doesn't hold on to the body heat. Okay. And that's uh, in the winter time. We see the poor iguanas around here. Well, poor, but they're invasive. Uh, they drop off the trees because they, they're cold and uh, they kind of go dormant. They drop off the trees. If it's very cold, uh, they are literally slept to death. <laughs> All right. Uh, some recover. Some, if it gets warm again the next day, they can recover. But if it stays cold for several days, they'll die because they are intolerant to the, to the cold weather. So then they come back because some variants are resistant <laughs> and they come back and now they're thriving again and they're back and forth. So you see that what seems to be a perfect adaptation is not really that perfect. There are disadvantages because the, the, the genotype is restrained, you know, the restrictions on it. For example, the knee, the forward knee and the backward knee, all right, between mammals and birds. Mammals, we have forward knees, right? When we walk, we walk with the knee, we bend the foot backwards, meaning that the knee is a forward knee. In birds, it seems like they have a backward knee. Seems like. Not really, I'll show you, but uh, it seems like they have a backward knee, right? It turns out the engineers tell us that this is a more efficient way of walking. <laughs> it's uh, more balance, it's less stress on the body, especially the column and so forth. It's more, uh, the, the, the column can be equally displaced, uh, actually, you know, pivot on, on the legs. Um, whereas this kind of walking puts much more stress on the back and it's not as efficient as a backward knee. The backward knee would be more kind of bouncy. All right. In fact, there is a field called theoretical biology uh, or sometimes futuristic biology. And one time I saw in that the theoretically, the ideal design for the human would be with a backward knee. <laughs> okay. The other way around, the leg is twisted uh, backwards and everything else would be more balance and so forth. However, I'm saying that the backward knee on birds only looks that way, but it's not really. It's another incredible functional adaptation to a walking style, okay, or a gait style that is more efficient. But look at the adaptation when we compare the bone structure. Look at this. Let's start with a hip that is white, all right? Here's our hip, and here's the bird hip, the, uh, the pelvic bone and the, right. Now, the femur, here's our femur, right? Look at the bird femur is here. The bird femur is embedded inside the body, is what it is. And then it's the tibia that is sticking out, the tibia. So this is the bird knee here, which is also forward looking or forward projecting. This is the bird knee between the femur and the tibia. This is ours, right? There's a little patella. Now we get down to the foot structure, the tarsus and the metatarsus. It turns out that the bird, the tarsus has super adapted out and long and the other tarsi have degenerated to a single tarsus. Okay. And the bird is literally walking on its toes on the metatarsi. See? Interesting. Whoops. So, really, what we have is a super adaptation for a gate walking that even just looking structurally at the bird here, the skeleton, it's a very dynamic skeleton. For walking and for walking fast and for bouncing, you know, 
uh, look at an ostrich uh, running through <laughs> this uh, fast runner and any one of these. Yes. That, um, we need to be aligned with the vehicle that we have a line of gravity. Yes. To, um, to be balanced. Exactly. The center of gravity. And because, you know, they fly and we don't, so we need to move 100% of the time walking. Yes. So I guess that's... Exactly, the whole body. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The crew. And in fact, we're the only one, the only species that has the developed bipedal locomotion. All right? The rest of the mammals, they have to go on all fours because no two pairs is sufficient to hold the weight for any prolonged time. Functionally. And so even the uh, chimpanzees and the gorillas and the other primates uh, that can go on two legs for a period of time, the hind legs, eventually they have to come down on four. And it's called knuckle walking. Knuckle walking because they have to come down on all fours eventually and they get tired because they don't have an S shape, they have a simple curve. And so they get tired of walking like this and they have to come down on their knuckles. So it's called knuckle walking, right? But we humans are the only ones who are adapted by pedal. But other, other mammals, so maybe the best way to um, illustrate this would be actually other mammals. Other mammals that are tetrapods and are locked in to using their forward limbs, their forward limbs also for walking. And therefore not free for making tools, for example. Because when we develop by pedal walking, the forward limbs are freed up for other stuff, basically for making tools. And then there's a synergy that happens between the brain and the tool and the hand, in the tool making that accelerates, makes the hand more sophisticated, makes the brain more sophisticated. Like if it's almost like a, it's a kind of parallel to runaway selection in, in sexual selection, but on the individual with the hand and the brain. All right, and so we have developed this huge brain capacity and a big drive of that has been the ability to use our hands with dexterity, all right? But the hands are dexterous because they're freed from having to walk. Mm -hmm. So it's a functional uh, difference that has enhanced our brain capacity. All right, so you see that the backward knee on the bird is only apparently so. <laughs> the fact is that the, the actual knee of the bird is buried inside the body, but it's here. And it is the second joint, the joint between the tarsus and the tibia, that has the backward bend, which is the same backward bend that we have. But you can see that this is a super adaptation, okay? Because again, birds coming from reptiles or reptile-like uh, structures, the reptiles are definitely tetrapods, right? They're four-legged. Think of a lizard, think of an alligator, uh, even turtles, they're four-legged. Except the snakes that lost their legs, all right? But that's a further adaptation, but they still have a hip. Why would a snake have a hip if it didn't have, if the ancestor did not have legs, hind legs? Hmm? All right, so all this to point out that the adaptedness that we see and that at first sight we say, oh, they're perfectly adapted to the environment, is not that perfect at all, okay? It's very limited by the ancestral genome, but they're inherited, so they're locked in. In other words, birds, cannot get away from being tetrapods. <laughs> it's just that they have adapted their forward legs to become wings and the hind legs to run and bounce in a very fast way. Okay, uh, yes, I have also here on the hand to clarify the difference then between structural and functional, right? We can see that structurally then, the, what we're calling the hip, um, what we're calling the knee of the bird, uh, 
is not really the knee, as we know a knee, okay? But functionally, it's doing the same thing. Functionally, it's doing the same. It's the main bend on the leg. It's the main bend. And it's what allows for locomotion. So that's why we have structure and we have function, all right? And when we think functionally, it's harder to think functionally because we don't really, what do we see? Again, I always, you know, I, I go into philosophizing a little bit, but I'm forever trying to bridge that gap between empiricism and the metaphysical. But uh, what do, uh, keeping in mind that the bulk of our information comes through which one of the five senses? The eye, the sight, right? The sight. And then the mind has to process that. But what do we see? Do we see structures or do we see functions? We see structures. You know, when I look at a door, unless I see the door moving, I'm looking at the structure of the door. From the structure, I need to figure out the function or not. Some functions are pretty obvious, but other functions are not that obvious. <laughs> okay? If we look at the structure, uh, we may not know exactly what the function is. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's important to make the difference. But I think that the key is in thinking functionally. And that's really what makes a scientist such a curious person, right? Curiosity is thinking functionally. How does this happen? Or why? Yeah, but the question why, but it's a small why. The, the why in science is a small why because it's typically trying to find out a function. How does it happen? Why truly, with a bit, with a capital W, belongs in philosophy, belongs in theology, belongs in metaphysics. It is the 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 reason for being. You know, why are we here? Why is there a nature? Why is there a universe? Science cannot answer that question because it's outside of this realm, because it cannot be measured. When we talk about science today, we're talking about empirical science, something that can be measured. And how do you measure the why question? Okay. But yet, those are the bigger questions that they're the more important questions. And they're the ones that take you know, more time to answer and to reflect and to ponder and to dialogue about because not everyone wants to go there. It's, it's a harder process of the mind to think about the why questions. Why are we here? Just to eat, drink, and be merry, then we disappear in the grave, or food for worms, kind of pretty sad, no? After going through all the process, imagine the process of eating and buying the food and cooking it and, and having to work to, to maintain ourselves for years and decades just to feed worms. Please, to feed maggots? <laughs> it's kind of, it would be too sarcastic, it would be too ironic, it would be too uh, tetric. Emma, you have some questions yes, or comments? Um, like, how do we get anomalies? Can birds and other animals get anomalies too? Yes. Like, uh, and humans, some of them are some of the sides and verses, so the board is good. Uh -huh. And they can survive and live their life longer. Yes. And that happens to birds too and other animals. Yes. In evolutionary terms, what would we call those anomalies? Of any particular species, right? Let's say we focus right. on a particular species, right. the human or whatever bird you want to choose. In evolutionary terms and stuff that we have covered in class, what would we call that individual that has that particular anomaly? He or she is a variant. It's a variant from the norm, right? So there's a norm. Most people have their organs the right side. This person has the organs upside down. So it's a variant on that particular trait. Maybe the head is fine, the, the eyes are fine, the legs are fine, but they, so it, on that particular trait. That's why, you know, it's a quantitative trait, right? They're variants. And some variants are extreme. Mm -hmm. Generally, extreme variants don't tend to survive unless it's a drastic change that favors that variation, then they're the ticket. They have the variation that will make them survive, that will allow them to survive, okay? But again, thinking in evolutionary terms, that would be a variant. It would be an extreme variation of a quantitative trait, right? Okay. So 
uh, two levels of adaptation that uh, Meyer talks about, right? The general adaptation and the specific adaptation. Typically, when we look at the window again and we see nature perfectly adapted, uh, we already realize that they're not that perfectly adapted. Uh, but we do um, look at typically what strikes us first at first sight is the specific adaptation. The specific adaptation. For example, whether it's a bird, a reptile, a fish, or a mammal, or an amphibian, which are harder to find now, uh, more and more they're so sensitive to environmental changes, uh, they're taking a hit. What we see, let's say between a mammal and a, let's see, we look out, we see some raccoons, and then we see some blue jays, and uh, we happen to see also a turtle out there, okay? What strikes us at first is the difference between a blue jay, a raccoon, and a turtle. Let's say it's a gopher turtle, which are local from South Florida. What strikes us first is the drastic difference between those three animals, a blue jay, a gopher turtle, and a raccoon. So if what strikes us is the difference between them, we're intuitively focusing at the specific adaptations which also tend to be generally more superficial, the shape, the morphos, okay? But behind the scenes, there is a general adaptation that we're not conscious of, but they all share together. That general adaptation is the same for the blue jay, for the gopher turtle, and for, uh, what did I say, raccoon. What is that general adaptation that is common to all three? One is a bird, one is a mammal, one is a reptile. They're all vertebrates. So they all have an internal skeleton. First, they have an internal skeleton as opposed to an external skeleton. Secondly, that internal skeleton is articulated. And particularly the spinal cord, the spinal, the, the column, all right? And so the general adaptation, and that's a general adaptation. It is an adaptation, but it's more general. It started earlier in the phylogenetics of those three organisms. So what birds, reptiles, and mammals, and amphibian and fish have in common is an internal skeleton that is articulated. You see? That's a general adaptation. Meaning that there are organisms that go further back that don't have an internal skeleton and it's not articulated, okay? So in phylogenetics, the break off was after the emergence of that general body plan of an internal skeleton that is articulated. So that's a general body plan and that is a good example of what would be a general adaptation in contrast to the specific adaptation or being either a bird, or a reptile, or a mammal. You see the point of the two, right? General and specific. But typically what we see normally, what catches our eye and our senses, is typically the specific adaptation, because that's the most distinguishing feature, and it tends to be also on the outside of the organism. Hmm? Internally, though, they're sharing an adaptation that is more general, hmm? more broad. And so whereas we have representatives of these five classes, right? The mammals, the amphibians, the fish, the reptiles, and the bird, even their skeleton as we compare them like this look pretty different, yet they are all, they all have an internal skeleton and that skeleton is obviously articulated, right? Okay. The skeleton could be external. For example, the arthropods. And they also have articulated appendages. But it's a very different adaptation. 
than the internal skeleton. And it occurred independently of the internal skeleton. It's not that these guys went through, excuse me, an internal skeleton phase first, and then somehow that internal skeleton degenerated or dissolved, and then they developed an external skeleton. No. And the vice versa is not either. We did not go, we vertebrates did not go through an internal skeleton, an external skeleton first, and then uh, eventually develop internal and get rid of the external skeleton. No. They're two separate adaptations altogether. And they're both generalized in that sense that there's a whole group of animals that have internal skeleton. And then there's another whole group of animals that have an external skeleton. Functionally, it has a similar function. And interesting that those two skeletons, those two types of skeletons are both articulated, meaning that they allow the organism to move around. Right? But based on different principles, one is internal, the other one is external. Very different. But functionally, they have the same function. <laughs> okay? It allows for those organisms actually to be bigger, to be macroscopic, <laughs> as opposed to no skeleton, then they have to restrict it to be, to live where? With no skeleton, either external or internal. Typically, they're gonna be smaller size, and they're going to be restricted to living in water, right? Because then it's the water that is keeping them buoyant, but not terrestrial. So in general, again, kind of thinking aloud, the ability to invade and colonize land is associated with the development of a skeleton, whether external or internal. Further, since I'm on the point, another uh, distinction, <clears throat> now we looked at similarities between the two skeletons, right? Allows them to populate land away from living outside of water and maintaining an internal water system, right? For, for metabolism. But then a further advantage, what is a further advantage of the internal skeleton plan, body plan, in contrast with the external skeleton body plan. Further, I'm, I'm, I'm saying already that there is a further advantage to the internal skeleton, at least by size. Think of the arthropods, right? Think of the terrestrial arthropods. Could be stronger. Actually, no. Uh, for example, the beetle, can pick up several times its own size, you know, with its uh, jaws and move it around. An ant, which is an arthropod, right? Uh, it's an insect. An ant can pick up a leaf or a twig that is several size, several times its own weight. Can we pick something our own weight? Barely, <laughs> not, not our own weight. <laughs> now, how about several times our own weight? Absolutely not, yeah, not even the bodybuilder. <laughs> so, and what allows them to do that for insects and arthropods in general is the external skeleton because it's equivalent, to, it's functionally equivalent to an armor, to having a tank, <laughs> all right? So the skeleton is actually stronger, but it's external as opposed to internal. So that means that the animal is literally what? Locked into that skeleton. And how do they grow? They have to molt, mm -hmm. right? And have to come out. And when they come out and they molt, they're soft. They were eating soft shell blue crab, delicious. I love soft shell blue crab. Luciana? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> what is soft shell blue crab? You eat the whole crab. It looks like a crab and it tastes delicious. <laughs> it's cooked, right? Because it's when they're molting. When they come out of the molt, out of the shell, Right, I go to the skeleton, and they're soft for one, two, or three days. Mm -hmm. And uh, but once that keratin hardens again, it's a reaction with the calcium, carcinogen carbonate, and so forth. It hardens, then that skeleton is rigid, but it locks them in so that it can only mold x number of times before they cannot mold anymore. So they stay relatively small compared to the internal skeleton. 
the internal skeleton has allowed vertebrates to become much larger in size and body mass. And therefore, who tend to be at the top of the food pyramid and on top of the food chain on land today, mammals, because of our internal skeleton, or vertebrates in general. We're larger. It is the fox that eats the, the caterpillar and not the caterpillar that eats the fox. <laughs> Okay, and so the internal skeleton has a further advantage compared to the external skeleton in that it allows for larger body mass in general for all vertebrates, but particularly for mammals. So that we, the mammal, the, the vertebrates in general and the mammals specifically have become the dominant species on land. And that has to do with the general body plan, not with a specific body plan. Right? It's a general adaptation. Other example of general and specific. For example, if we talk about the various wing phenotypes, the shapes of wings, is that a general or a specific adaptation? The shapes of wings. Different species of birds that have different shapes of wings, right? according to their habitat, according to their behavior, and so forth. Mm -hmm. So that would be a specific adaptation. The different shapes of wings among birds, it is a specific adaptation. It is a diverse phenotype, and we can talk about quantitative traits between species and within species also. Within the blue jay, each blue jay will have slightly variants on uh, wing shape, right? Feathers also about diverse feather phenotype, is that general or specific adaptation? Specific, specific, it's pretty detailed, right? It's pretty specific. But the fact that birds have wings, regardless of the shape of the wing and the size of the wing, the wingness of birds is a general adaptation of all birds. Even if the wings are non-functional, as in the ostrich, for example, or the emu, all right? because they got so good at running around and they didn't have any natural predators when they lived, uh, when their ancestors lived, that the wings became degenerate. Mm -hmm. But they still have wings. So wingness is a general adaptation within the birds. Also, we can make the same argument for featherness, right? The fact of feathers, regardless of the shape, is a general adaptation for birds in general, right? This also happens in plants, not just the animals, but also plants. And I'm choosing here conifers for two reasons. First, because they're less known for us in the subtropical environment that we have. And secondly, because I'm gonna talk about conifers later when we talk about convergent evolution. Okay. So conifers are also known as pine trees and they have a special adaptations to what kind of uh, climate? Cold in general, exactly. And drastic change in the seasons between summer and winter particularly, but especially the winter tends to be prolonged, tends to be very cold, typically with temperatures below zero centigrade, meaning below freezing, right? And also, so if, it rains under freezing conditions, that rain is going to solidify, crystallize, and what do we call a raindrop crystal? A snowflake, okay? So these guys are adapted to snow, which is solid water falling on them. And one little grain of snow, one little speck of uh, snow, snowflake, is no big deal. When the, the, they start piling up, it's water, and water tends to be heavy, all right? And if a roof is not well designed under heavy snow, that roof will collapse. Mm -hmm. And so these guys have adapted to those kind of uh, winters, harsh environment, in several ways. 
they have, from what we can see externally, right? They have needles instead of leaves. You notice that a needle accumulates much less snow on top of it than a leaf. Because a leaf would, would collapse if it had snow on top of it, right? Because it would burn. So they have developed needles instead of leaves. They have developed cones instead of flowers. Mm -hmm. The cone, as you can see, uh, is uh, much uh, harder, rigid, and uh, more protected. What's the whole function? What's the function of a cone? To how? Yes, yeah, the reproductive structure. This one in particular is a female cone, so it holds ovules. Each one of these is called a scale, right? It's a scale, and at the base of each scale will be one or two eggs, one or two ovules, just waiting to be fertilized by the pollen. Mm -hmm. And so there, these are female cones, they're also male cones, which are smaller, and they produce pollen instead of eggs. That's the reproductive structure. Underneath the ground, so every plant, regardless of whether it's a conifer or a flowering plant or a bush or even a tuft of grass, right? Every plant structurally is classified in two parts or is, um, is named in two parts. What is underground is known as the root or the root system. And what is above ground is known as the shoot system, shoot, all right? Uh, shoot system, as in uh, the part is structure of plants, plants above ground, above the soil, right? So The, tap, the, the root system of uh, conifers is what is known as a tap root. It has a main root, and then it has secondary roots coming out of it, right? But this main root goes typically deep, 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 deep down looking for liquid water because the ground will be uh, cold and frozen. And so it's looking for liquid water deep down, and it has what is known as a positive geotropism. Don't worry about that. It's attracted by gravity. <laughs> okay, the shoot system has a negative geotropism. It reacts. It goes against gravity, and it has a a positive phototropism. It's attracted by light. Okay, so the shoot system grows above ground. It shoots up from the ground, literally. These are special adaptations to the cold winters up north. There's another adaptation that is internal, which is their circulation is not sap like it is uh, for flowering plants here in the tropics and the temperate environment. It is called, it's called resin. resin. They have resin instead of sap, right? Now, Sap is a white, milky substance that has a high content of water. When the temperature goes to freezing, what do you think happens to that sap? Yes, it becomes thick, actually. It becomes thick and slows down. All right, so sound a lot, and the tree basically goes dormant, equivalent to hibernation in animals. But resin is very thick with very little water content, and so in the winter time, doesn't freeze. It continues to circulate. What does that mean? It means that the tree can continue metabolizing during winter, and that's why they're called evergreen. So conifers are also called pine trees, and they're also called evergreen because in the winter, in contrast to the other trees, to the deciduous trees that drop their leaves, the conifers are evergreen and they stay green and that gives them the leg up because they're also slow growing, but they're growing throughout the year. And that gives them the advantage, the selective advantage, in contrast to the deciduous trees in the forest, that in the wintertime 
they drop their leaves because the weather, uh, the, the, the temperature is, uh, is too harsh for them, but these guys are adapted, all right? So those are special adaptations that we can see. Uh, and so we can again talk about general and specific adaptations. General adaptations of all conifers are needles instead of leaves, are cones instead of flowers, are tap roots instead of secondary roots, and internally also uh, resin instead of sap. Right? Then specific adaptations, essentially we would like to see, we would have to see each specific uh, pine tree species, each conifer species of which there are dozens, um, and there will be specific adaptations. Some are taller, some are wider. Okay. But those will be specific adaptations and they are species specific between conifers, right? Between pine trees, different species of pine trees. The one we have here, which is known as Dade County slash pine, is the only pine species, the only conifer that has adapted to a subtropical environment. We're talking more about these pine trees because they're unique, they're very special, and we happen to have an urban forest, which is the last remaining highland urban forest of pine trees in Dade County, all right? And so we're very, very proud of our forest. We're trying to conserve it. And I'll be talking more about this in the summertime when we we'll look at the environmental bioethics uh, program, of uh, course. Okay, but my point here is that just like animals, they have uh, general and specific adaptations so the plants have general and specific adaptations it's across the board. And we can make the same case for the third group of the kingdoms of uh, the fungi. They also have general and specific adaptations, right? Okay. Now, <clears throat> when we put the sum total of the animals with their general and specific adaptations, living together, different populations made up of individual species, right? Together, they form what we call a community, a community. Okay, so here, uh, before, sorry, before I get into that, here is an example of placental mammals. Look at all these animals. Uh, there are about three dozen um, families of uh, mammals, okay? Now, <clears throat> a placental mammals. They look very different from each other, specifically because, again, our eye focuses on the specific adaptations of a bat versus a mouse versus a primate versus a cetacean, a whale, all right? Those are all specific adaptations. But the general adaptation of these mammals, first of all, they are what? They're tetrapods. So they all have four legs, okay, or four appendages. They have an internal skeleton that is articulated because they're vertebrates. And they're mammals, meaning that they'll have two more characteristics that makes them mammal in contrast with other vertebrates that also have an internal skeleton that is articulated. For example, uh, a reptile or a bird or a fish. Two characteristics. One, the, the word comes from mammary glands. They have mammary glands, so they feed the young, okay? The mother feeds the young in general. And the other, I, I said two, right? The other one is hair, mm -hmm. hair. Even the whales have hairs, okay? They have a few tufts of hairs uh, around their fins. And uh, where are the tits of, uh, of uh, female whales? and cetaceans in general, dolphins. It's in the axilla, <laughs> in the back, uh, on the pectoral fin here, back. And a calf, whale, will drink several hundred gallons of milk daily <laughs> while it's nursing, okay? So, exactly. Talk about specific adaptation and function, and talk about behavior, okay? And the matching up of that. And the mom has to prop up the, the young to the surface, the calf to teach him or her to breathe from the surface because they have lungs, you know. The thing has migrated to the top of the head, the nostril, 
but they have lungs that have to breathe from the surface and they're not born with that behavior. <laughs> they have to be taught to breathe from the surface. So a lot of specific adaptations, which by the way, reminds me to include behavior in the adaptations. So the adaptations are, again, those realms that we saw, the levels of structural, functional, behavioral, and ultimately biochemical, right? Okay, so here's an example. These are placental mammals in contrast to the marsupials, which are also mammals. Therefore, they also have mammary glands and hair, but they're not placental, meaning that they don't have, the young don't have a placenta. So the internal gestation is different. There's no actual internal gestation as such. I'll talk about marsupials when we, uh, in, the second, in the break, the second part when we talk about convergent evolution, okay? That's uh, the second part. But my point here is that we can look at the first thing that strikes us again is the specific adaptation of all the different species of mammals, of placental mammals. But then we can start looking at common characteristics, even though they look so different, an elephant from a squirrel. They have a general body plan that is common. And we can already say in addition to the internal skeleton that is articulated, because they're mammals, they also share two more characteristics between a, a, a squirrel and a, an elephant. In addition to an articulated internal skeleton, what is the two general characteristics that they share? An elephant and a squirrel. Hair and memory glands. And because they are placental, they also, they're young, their embryos also have a placenta, which is a vital organ, temporary, discarded at birth, right? Okay? Okay. So general and specific, we get the point. Now, again, what's the intuition? When we look at embryonic development, which are going to kick in first? The general adaptations or the specific adaptations? General, general adaptation, all right? A painter, before she or he paints anything, needs a canvas and needs colors. So, and that's the same tools that any painter is gonna use. Then he or she will put on that canvas whatever they wanna do, but the general adaptations kick in first, all right? And so in embryonic development, we see, again, the similarity there's gonna be greater similarity in the earlier embryos of different species, of different classes. And as development goes forward, then more specific adaptations arise and keep arising, arising until that animal hatches or is born. And then we see the distinguishing specific adaptations that make that animal a species, a particular species, as opposed to another species of that same general group. So the general adaptations start developing first, and that's why the earlier embryos look alike. The extreme, when we go back, the extreme is, the extreme similarity is going to be at the earliest stage, and which is the earliest stage? The early stage is the zygote, the fertilized egg, right? Which by definition is no longer an egg, so this is kind of an oxymoron. Once a gamete is fertilized, it's no longer haploid, it's diploid, and therefore zygote is better. It's a better word. But anyway, at the zygote level, we all look alike. We meaning animals, plants, you know, all living organisms, all eukaryotes. <laughs> Basically, it's a tiny cell, round, microscopic with a nucleus inside. And the only thing that's going to be different perhaps will be kind of the size of that fertilized egg, the kind of the size of that zygote. They say that a cow zygote can actually be seen with the naked eye, <laughs> is that big. But other than size, it essentially looks the same as any other mammalian egg, uh, zygote or even vertebrate zygote and invertebrate zygote. And of course, as development progresses, then the more specific characteristics uh, emerge. 
Another point, uh, I mentioned it already, but basically the organisms, again, that we see looking at the window, even though at first sight they look to, they seem to be perfectly adapted, they're not that perfectly adapted. They're constrained by typically the general adaptations that they inherited from their ancestors. And typically, you understand that we inherit our general, our specific adaptations we also inherit, but for more recent ancestors. From earlier ancestors or common ancestors, we inherit the more general adaptations. Like for example, for example, land animals, tetrapods, right? Turtles, which are reptiles, marine turtles. I think this is a hawksbill turtle. It's a marine turtle. It's a reptile, but reptiles evolved on land. And secondarily, these turtles were stubborn enough to go back to the ocean, okay? And there are a number of species of marine turtles, but it is secondarily. It's a secondary adaptation to the marine life. And what tells us 100% for sure that their ancestors came from land, right, is what? That they have, yes, they have lungs. They don't have gills, right? And once they develop gills, they're no longer going to be turtles. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you can see this is an X, an X ray of a turtle <laughs> that uh, is showing the lungs. So no gills in there. Mm -hmm. Still tetrapod, as you can see, has the four limbs, the four fins, but they are super adaptive to the point that the digits have fused and degenerate and so forth, and now they're essentially flippers. And they're functionally similar to the uh, tail and the fins of a fish, but they're not fish, they're reptiles. Mm -hmm. They have adapted functionally, but there's a constraint, and the constraint is that they have to come to the surface periodically to breathe because they have lungs. And that is exposure, that's a disadvantage. By coming up to the surface periodically, they're exposed. The, the surface of the ocean is actually more dangerous than the, that the interface of the ocean, that the water column, you know, what is called the, the pelagic region, because they're, between, they're at the interface between two fluids. And so generally there's more danger, more exposure at the interface between two fluids than being immersed totally in one fluid or the other. Can stay for a long period of time. Yeah. Yes, sometimes even hours. It's yeah, amazing. It's amazing. It really is amazing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the first thing that strikes me as we look at this x ray here, look at the, the proportion, the percentage proportion of these lungs compared to the body mass of the rest of the turtle. There's not much else <laughs> in there, okay, except perhaps the head and the flippers. But the rest is just a carapace, is the shell, mm -hmm. and there's very little rest of tissue in there. So that lung, that breath that he or she takes is gonna last a long time, very efficient. Plus they're gliding, you know, they're not very actively. Yeah, much energy, I guess. Exactly, low metabolism, low metabolism. They're also immersed, Remember, they're cold-blooded, right? They're not endotherms, and they're immersed in water, typically salt water, which is cooler temperature, so it's keeping their metabolism low. Mm -hmm. So the point is that it works. Somehow it works. Maybe that was they're so slow. Yes, exactly. Yeah, it is. And that's a behavioral adaptation, right? But the, what I'm trying to point out is that as perfect as they may seem, they're not really that perfect. There are... Uh, they're constrained, all right? They're constrained, for example, because of the general adaptations that are, uh, they're not vestigial because they're functional, but it constrains them to have to go, even though they live, they totally live in, in the ocean, they have to go to the surface uh, for breathing every time they breathe. Mm -hmm. uh, number one, number two, something we don't see here in the picture is that they have to lay their eggs outside on land. Mm -hmm. So that's another exposure when they go out to land to lay their eggs. They're also exposed to hunters, to predators, right? And so that's a disadvantage of having adapted to uh, the marine life.
Okay, so the idea is that even though it may seem that all the organisms that we see today are perfectly adapted, you know, <clears throat> they're not really perfectly adapted, they're well adapted. They're well adapted to the current environment, but they're not perfectly adapted. There is no perfection, if you will, in nature. Because it could always be better, if you will. Otherwise, there would be no evolution, right? right. <laughs> there always be a better design. And the variant that has that better design, when there's an environmental stress, that variant, chances are, probabilistic chances are, that the variant that has the better design is the one that's going to survive. But again, it's a chance because it may not survive. Maybe a rock fell on top of it before it survived. <laughs> so it ran out of luck. Okay. So really chance is big into this process. All right. Uh, coming to the break now, I want to make the point of uh, a community because since we've been talking about adaptation and really adaptation is species specific, right? The, the, the specific, what we see, the specific adaptations is really what makes a species at the end of the day. And we know that species coming together, individuals of the same species coming together, they form what? Yeah. Individuals of the same species coming together, they form population, populations. Now, populations of different species coming together, they form a community. And we're getting more and more realistic because we don't see just populations of penguins flying out, you know, in the vacuum. And we don't see populations of squirrels like just in a vacuum like this. No, they're in a particular niche, in a habitat, all right, in an ecosystem. And there are going to be other animals and plants living in that same local environment. And that's what forms the community. Community then is two or more populations of different species interacting somehow. Part of the food chain. So you have, and this not only at the level of animals, but also at the level of plants. And not only at the level of animals and plants, but also at the level of the fungi. So here is a community, for example, which is known as a deciduous forest. Deciduous meaning that they shed their leaves in the fall and in the winter they're barren, but they're not dead. These trees that shed their leaves in the fall and in the winter are barren, <clears throat> they're not dead. Because in the spring, then they spring out, the, the little buds spring forward and spring out and eventually generate new leaves through the spring and in the summertime in full bloom and everything else <clears throat> until the following fall. So it's a yearly cycle, all right, of seasons. And in the temperate region, it's more or less equivalent. Each season has about three months. So it's three times four is 12. So this is what is known as a temperate deciduous forest. It could be the, a broad band, a broad swath along North America, along the, the United States. Okay, this is the most common type of uh, ecosystem in the United States uh, across from shore to shore. We find a variety of uh, populations made up of individual species, right? Interacting with one another. Some are producers, like the plants. Some are consumers, like the animals and the fungi which are a particular type of consumer. They're saprophytes. They feed on decaying material. <clears throat> and uh, it's showing mostly individuals here. Here's a deer, but one can intuit that this is one of several deer that live together in this forest. So that's a population of deer, right? And we see a beaver uh, nest here. So there would be a population of beavers in this uh, lake and a population of uh, black bear or brown bear, population of turkey, et cetera, et cetera. But the same is for the plants. There'll be a population of aspen and maple and other shrubs, et cetera. Same population of fungi, two different types of populations here. Here's one population of fungi, here's another population. <clears throat> 
right? Together interacting with one another, some being consumers, some being producers, some being herbivores, some being carnivores, this form a community, okay? They form a community, they inhabit a local area. They all inhabit a local area and they, they each have their niche. They each have their niche. So the competitive exclusion principle forbids any two different species inhabiting the same niche, right? Competitive exclusion. But again, these guys here don't live in a vacuum, right? This particular forest is going to have abiotic factors. What we're seeing are all biotic factors. What we're seeing, again, are biotic factors. But we, think, we need to think functionally. What do these plants and animals need in order to survive in this region here, in this local area? They need, exactly, they need water, they need sun, they need air, they need humidity, right? Those are the abiotic factors. So when we take a community, which is made up of living organisms, living populations, and we add the abiotic factors, then we have an ecosystem. And that's what is an ecosystem. So an ecosystem is the community of living organisms plus the environmental factors. That's an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Ecosystem. And that's getting more realistic because now we have the fuller picture. And the temperature and the amount of water and the amount of light and so forth will affect that population, that, that community, and will affect different populations in different ways. Okay? So really, it's a dynamic and a complex system. It's a complex system that is dynamic and it's also moving all the time because these animals are moving in and out of this forest. The plants are also moving in and out of the forest, slower pace but also moving in and there's going to be succession and so forth. All of those we'll see in greater detail in the environmental course in the middle of the, uh, in the summer, okay? But it's a very dynamic and complex system. And this is at the macroscopic level, what we see with plain sight. Now, how about the microscopic level? Even more so because all of these plants and animals and, and fungi, they're all covered with bacteria and viruses and spores. And it's an incredible complexity that is going on here living dynamic and makes for life makes for life all these adapted more or less well adapted but never perfectly adapted right because it doesn't exist this is on land and the same argument can be made in water for the ocean where we have a number of uh, species that coming together uh, a number of individuals of any one species coming together, they will uh, make what is known as a population. And then those populations coming together in a very dynamic way, moving in and out, will make the community. Then we add the abiotic factors and that makes the ecosystem. So we have terrestrial ecosystems and we have a, a marine or aquatic ecosystems, right? Just as complex, if not more, because now we have to deal with the chemistry of the water, which is much more complex than the chemistry of the air, right? The equivalent fluid on land is air. All right. This one is also, again, emphasizing the, uh, what do we call this? The, the disadvantage of being adapted, <laughs> okay? The disadvantage of being adapted, the, we talked about the bones already being hollow, the bones of uh, fish, uh, uh, sorry, bones of uh, birds. Fish are constrained to having a, an aero, a hydrodynamic body, right? They're constrained to having a hydrodynamic body, so all the appendages have to be minimal because that's all drag. The appendages are drag and therefore, they, they, they're minimized. Mm -hmm. uh, also, the eye, for example, mm, look at the, the lens of a fish eye as compared to the lens of a human eye. Huge, and there's going to be a constraint. How big can you make that ball, you know, before that eye, that lens is just too big, 
And in fact, fish are very limited in their sight. They have compensated uh, with, uh, what's the other uh, external sense too that have compensated for the lack of a good vision like we have on land. Because mm -hmm. hearing, yes, the lateral line, right? Which is like an extended ear on both sides of the fish, but also the smell, smell. You said that a shark can detect a, a drop of blood like a mile away or something like that. It's amazing, the smell and the sound. Because again, water carries sound very well. So whales can stay in the same pod, even if they cannot see each other, but they can hear each other. Now whales being mammals, they don't have a lateral line, but they do have a very uh, well-developed uh, um, hearing. Anyway, the, in plants also, the constraint of leaves is that they have to be horizontal to be most efficient. You know, a vertical leaf is not going to work that well. <laughs> so they're constrained to being horizontal, flat, uh, to catch, to maximize uh, light exposure. But that uh, has its own disadvantages as opposed to being uh, vertical. Okay, now we're going to stop here. And we're going to take a little break and we'll come back to look at uh, convergent evolution. Before I take the break, let me just take a little hand up briefly. I'm going to go away to... Uh, I have a curiosity. Yes. Mm -hmm. Seems like in humans, for example, right. the bone marrow is with the red cells. Are yes. Two. yes. How about in the birds that they have this solid bone? Right. Um, again, thinking aloud, not being an ornithologist, right, who, who is a specialist on birds, uh, not all bones, it would be the bigger bones of the body that are hollow, but other bones would not be as hollow. And we know that, for example, the femur does produce uh, a lot of RBCs, but also the ribs, right? Right, and, and, the, and the, the vertebrae. Also. And the vertebrae, oh, interesting, okay, I didn't know that. So um, I'm just thinking uh, aloud here that the ribs of- the pelvis. Pelvis also. Yeah. Oh, yeah, pelvis is a little more bone structure, but I'm thinking particularly the ribs of uh, birds. I don't know for sure, but I'm just thinking that the ribs of birds are probably the ones that produce most uh, bone marrow, bone um, uh, uh, RBCs. But anyway, it has to be the marrow somewhere. Right. Okay. So, I'm just curious. Yeah, yeah. I don't know exactly which bones would be, but the bigger bones are going to be hollow. Yeah. Plus, you know, this, I think that these bones are bleached, these photographs are bleached. There's going to be some marrow in there anyway, okay, because of the porosity. I'm just thinking that the porosity is indicating that there's going to be marrow embedded in there. So, and apparently it's sufficient, which is also an interesting point. Think about it a little bit more because typically birds tend to use a lot of energy in flight, right? Which is high metabolism. Right. Mm -hmm. But th their body structure is actually very small. Very when light, I guess, they are light. The body mass, you, when, you, when, when you defeather a bird, you're left with a very small thing, <laughs> okay? <Yeah. laughs> the body mass is small and light, and that's what needs to be oxygenated anyway. So obviously it's sufficient, but the, the bone marrow proportionally is much less for sure. Okay, uh, what else do we have? I was just looking here for a moment. Okay, so we got community, the constraints I talked about. Okay, so we'll leave uh, convergent evolution for after the break. Let me see our fellows in the uh, chat. Anyone has a question out there? Brother Roberto, you're okay. And Russell had to leave, so catch up with the video. Okay, little break. Let me pause this and we'll come back in a little while. Uh, pause recording, give it about 15 minutes. Okay, welcome back, everyone. Come on, question. Yes. yes. Uh, the bio 514, the um, assignment that we submitted, do we get those back graded or, or not? Uh, I haven't read them yet. I know you have submitted. I'm waiting for the others to submit. Okay. So that's probably just going to be a check mark that, oh, okay. that is completed. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have a deadline for the? 
for the first part? Or? Yes, it's actually uh, the first week of December. So I'm glad you bring that up mm -hmm. because basically you have a month left yeah, to do those, it. all right? So there's uh, one month will be the first week of December because then I have to submit grades. Okay. So that's for the 514, for the summaries. Now on the modules, it turns out that I logged into this um, site at the University of uh, Chicago of Illinois and they disabled the module, the three modules, temporarily because they had some kind of a bug. And so they had to do it quickly because the bug was, I think it was viral or something like that. It was hitting into their system. And so they had to disconnect the modules. But I mean, email with them and they're giving me now suggestions. They're going to repopulate those three modules in the, their own, it's going to be from the library of the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, okay? And they said they would be ready in a, well, a week or so, those uh, three modules. Alternatively, they gave me some websites there that I can explore as an alternative for the online uh, modules. But uh, I'd rather have those. So let's give it one more week, all right, for the three modules. You'll see they're very simple. It just takes a little reading and then you do the reading and then they ask you a few questions and you click on the answer and you move on to the next module. So it's not complicated, it's, it's simple, uh, but there are three and they cover the different aspects of uh, responsible research and uh, research uh, conduct or behavior, all right? So they're very attuned to what we do in class and, and the course itself. So I'd rather have those modules uh, have a preference. Anyway, all this to say that my suggestion we work on the summaries in the meantime. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, by next week, by the end of next week, I should know if those modules are going to be available. Otherwise, I'll give you an alternative website to do something similar. Okay, so all that right? course is the models and the And summary. the summaries, okay. yeah, that's the 514. Yeah. Before the summary yeah. course. Right, and then at the last class, we'll talk a little bit about it, just, uh, but I want to see your summaries first. That way I can refer to it a little bit, you know, the, uh, the things that are important in research today from the bioethical perspective. It's mostly about the procedures or where keep the data, the confidentiality of the data and things like that. All right. But I'll, I'll touch on those at the very end once you've done your summaries. Okay. You can send me summaries like four at a time. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Any group at a time, just keep sending them and I'll paste them together make a whole document out of them when, once you send them, all right? Yeah. All right, any uh, questions or comments from what we've covered so far? We're looking at adaptedness as an after the fact, post facto, right, as an after the fact event. Simply, again, we look at the window, we see the organisms have adapted, but it's not in something active or directly that the organism will say, okay, I'm going to adapt this way or that way. No, it's just the variant that is best fit, is the one that tends to survive on average. And so those characteristics do get passed on because they are on the genotype. Remember, the phenotype is reflecting the genotype. But the genotype is impervious. There's no, there's no phenotype that is going to impact the genotype, in other words. Right? So finally, uh, well, the difference between the general adaptation or the specific adaptations, and then that there are constraints of all kinds. So there's really no perfect adaptation. It's just the best adaptation for that particular environment. All right, let me do this. Okay. Now we're going to move into this area of convergent evolution, which is fascinating. And people are not necessarily familiar with it, even though we've all heard about the marsupials in Australia, for example, okay, and how interesting they are. Now, marsupials are also mammals, see, marsupial, but that, re that marsupials is a pouch, it's a reference to a pouch, okay. Uh, so, placenta, we said that placenta, 
they are embryos have a placenta, which points to internal gestation, right? Internal gestation, or what we normally call pregnancy. <laughs> okay, now marsupials, No placenta, have a pouch instead. So the embryo develops inside the pouch <laughs> or the pocket. What's happening inside that pouch? Because the embryo is immature when the embryo, the embryo is born prematurely, okay? And this is what happens. Each one of these squares is giving you a marsupial and an equivalent placental mammal. First of all, these are all mammals. So they have the general adaptations of what? Yes, but even because they're vertebrates, right? Then they have internal skeleton that is articulated. Then because they're mammals, they have hair and mammary glands. Right? But then there are these two great categories, placental or marsupial. Okay? And for every marsupial animal here, marsupial mammal, the diagram is given a placental mammal. Now, where do these marsupials live today? Mostly where? Australia, Australia New Zealand, right? Australia which is a continent down there, southern hemisphere, very far away from us. Northern hemisphere, the other side, about 12 hours difference <laughs> from time zone, okay? And yet, look how similar they look. This is a flying squirrel. This is a placental flying squirrel. Mm -hmm. And this is a marsupial glider. It's called a glider. Okay. This one is a marsupial mouse, and this is a house mouse, a North American mouse, Mus musculus. This is the one on the lab also. <laughs> this is a marsupial mole, and this is a placental mole. The wolf, placental wolf, and the Tasmanian wolf, all right? Tasmanian wolf or Tasmanian tiger. Another marsupial, a wombat. This is called a wombat. And this one is the woodchuck. This one, the spots mostly, even though the behavior is somewhat different, but the spots. It, this is a, called a native cat, a marsupial called native cat, which is not really a feline. So the cat is, we would have to put the cat in quotations because felines are all carnivores. And one thing we know from Australia that marsupials are no carnivores, they're all herbivores, right? Okay. And here is a leopard, which has similar spotting. Also, this is a numbat, that's called a numbat or a banded anteater. And here is a giant anteater from... Uh, these are from Africa. The point is that the marsupials, right, they all live in Australia, New Zealand, Tasmania, those southern islands, uh, way far away from us, far away from Africa, even more far away from North America. And yet, these animals look very similar, very similar in morphology, in shape, the structure, and the function even, because the gliding, the glider, and the flying squirrel also have this extra skin in between the limbs, the fore limbs and the hind limbs, that allows them to glide. They don't actually fly, but they glide from one tree to another. So we see that structurally, functionally, and behaviorally, 
the European mole and the Australian mole, they dig under the ground, they have the same behavior, and they have structures to uh, help them do that. And yet, they diverged millions of years ago. In other words, when was the last time that North America and Australia were together? Pangea. <laughs> okay. Even Gondwanaland already separated them. And that was millions and millions of years ago. So their, their ancestors, their common ancestor is very far removed, very far back. And yet they look very similar. So they have adapted, right? They have developed these characteristics. Or these characteristics have been selected on them that are similar. This is a process called parallel and convergent evolution, mostly convergent evolution. So that they first diverged from a common ancestor, which would be a common mammal, right? After the dinosaurs, about 65 million years ago, the little mammals that managed to survive the dinosaurs, they were little things like little hot dogs with, uh, that, that uh, had hair and were able to hide in between the rocks to evade the, the, the voracious uh, dinosaurs. When the dinos were wiped out, then mammals, there was a, a niche availability, right? And that was the age of the mammals now, this divergence, this radiation of, and now we call it the age of the mammals. Also because it's cooler and cooler and cooler, and because of the hair, we're able, we mammals, uh, are able to adapt, uh, are, are more, um, are better adapted to colder weather. All right. But the, the, the common ancestry between marsupials and placentals is at the very beginning of the divergence of mammals, right? Because it's the, it's the one characteristic that, 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 that uh, splits us. In other words, they don't even have the marsupials, don't even have a placenta. But they are mammals. They're mammals, meaning that they do have membrane glands. And that's actually what is inside the pouch. <laughs> so what happens with the marsupials, well, first the placentals, we know the embryonic development. Uh, we placentals, not just humans, but all the placental mammals, all right? In other words, the squirrel, the mouse, the mole, the, the real wolf, the real woodchuck, the real tiger, okay? All of these mammals, of which are about three dozen um, families, more or less, placental mammals, they all have internal fertilization and internal gestation. Because birds, for example, have internal fertilization. In other words, birds copulate, but then the gestation is external, outside of the body, namely inside an egg. Right? So it's not the same to have internal fertilization is one thing, but to have internal gestation, to have a pregnancy, is a fertile level of development, which typically involves fewer offspring, because now those offspring are offered a time, an embryonic time of protection by the very body of the mother, whatever the mammal is, including the whales, all right? And so for X number of months, it could be up to a year, year and a half of pregnancy, that embryo, that fetus is protected by the actual body of the mother and is also being nourished and so forth, right? Whereas marsupials have none of that because they don't have a placenta to begin with. So they have no feeding a mechanism for an internal gestation as such, for an internal pregnancy. And that's why they're considered more primitive, the marsupials, more primitive in general than the placentals. In other words, that the placenta developed later, but did not develop in Australia and New Zealand and uh, New Caledonia and all those uh, islands down there. <clears throat> 
what's the uh, what was the alternative the alternative is that the embryo is actually born prematurely prematurely like a little fetus okay and that little embryo crawls on the belly of the mother and goes into the pouch mm -hmm. by instinct kangaroos for example all right so the embryo crawls inside the pouch and then inside the pouch of the mother, there will be typically one or two tits that have a very long nipple, and they swallow the nipple. <laughs> so that's a functional equivalent of a placenta or an umbilical cord. <laughs> so the little embryo crawls out, is born prematurely, very delicate, no hair, and will crawl up into the belly, into the pouch, into the marsupials, and then hunt for that little tit and swallow the nipple, which is long enough to go directly down into the stomach. <laughs> and they'll suckle there uh, for months until eventually they'll put the head out of the, the pouch for the first time and look around <laughs> and see the world out there. <laughs> That's kind of the equivalent of their second birth. <laughs> but at that time, they're fairly big and the kangaroo uh, baby is called a kid, right? A kangaroo kid is pretty big and it's inside that pouch <laughs> moving around and the mom is trying to get rid of that kid. <laughs> uh, and it crawls without the mother, right? Exactly. Exactly. The mother has to be passive. And so that's a big selecting process there. That's big time selection there. Is that pre psychotic or post psychotic? Definitely post psychotic, all right? But it's pre adult. And so that's post-psychotic when that little embryo is born prematurely and as a fetus has to crawl through the belly of the mom into the pouch. Many of them don't make it. But what was their advantage? What was that possible? It turns out that marsupials, they're vegetarian. In other words, they're herbivores. They're no carnivores. And so there's no one, there's no animal that is hunting down the marsupials actively. There's no predator, no natural predators over there in Australia and New Zealand and so forth. There are no natural predators to the marsupials. So the mom can relax and take her time and let that embryo crawl up into the belly because no one is going to come around and no tiger is going to hunt them down or anything like that. They don't have any natural enemies. See, so it allowed them to maintain that kind of premature birth, whereas when carnivores developed, that was a no-no. Those marsupials, those early marsupials, with the rise of carnivores, were all extinct. They were eaten up because they did not survive the selective pressure of the predators. You see? And predators could have been also not necessarily other mammals. It could have been, I'm thinking of reptiles or birds. They could also be predators. You know, like uh, eagles and, and so forth, or large, large uh, large snakes or large um, uh, lizards or the reptiles on the placenta, all right? But the marsupials had none of that pressure. And so it allowed them to maintain, they just maintained that primitive premature birth that has some selection, but you know, the embryos that make it on average are gonna be the stronger embryos. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you can see that internal gestation is a passive, it's an adaptation, it's a further adaptation to predation from other mammals or from carnivores in general. Is it protected? Yes, because now the, the hunter has to take down the whole mother to get to the embryo. <laughs> you know? Okay, so let me see where I was at. Yeah. So it's interesting, and that is uh, what has, uh, but the interesting thing here is, um, because we can say that that mode of embryonic development for marsupials, for marsupials, is that gen, uh, a general adaptation or a specific adaptation? For all marsupials, it's the same. So it's general, all right? And for placentals, the placenta is also general. But for the original divergence of mammals into either placental or marsupial, 
then the placenta is a specific adaptation for that original divergence in the ancestry, okay? Which had to happen millions of years ago also because that split happened after the development of mammary glands. In other words, marsupials do have mammary glands, so they are mammals. So they are earlier mammals, or their ancestors, you know, they're earlier mammals. So the mammary glands, in other words, mammary glands already developed, had already developed that mechanism of feeding the young before the placenta developed. We can intuit that, right? Convergent evolution happens in many, many species. Now, the big issue of convergent evolution is the geographical separation. In other words, a similar environment, similar environment, but worlds apart, you know, uh, in two geographic re uh, regions that are totally disconnected, totally unconnected. For example, Australia and North America, or even Australia and Africa. There are oceans, mountains, they could have similar climates, but the, the, the two geographies are totally disconnected. And that's what makes the convergence, the convergence evolution, after an initial divergence, okay? And like I say, it's not just restricted to mammals. It happens also in birds, for example. Here we have, um, the hummingbird, which is uh, from North America and Central America, most of America has hummingbirds. And then there is an equivalent, a functional equivalent in the Hawaiian Islands called the honey creeper, okay? Which has a similar beak because they feed on nectar of the flower, just like the hummingbird here also feeds on nectar. So you see, it's a functional equivalent. They're exploiting the same niche. They're exploiting a, not the same, a similar habitat with similar weather. This would be uh, tropical to temperate. The Hawaiian Islands are gonna be tropical. So similar climate, similar environmental factors, but two different geographical regions, totally disconnected. So that today, no hummingbird has made it across the Pacific to Hawaii, and no honey creeper has made it across the Pacific to North America, unless they were introduced by some humans to try to sell them or something like that as pets. Okay, but naturally they haven't made it. And this is another case of parallel or convergent evolution. Other example, look at these two porcupines. They look so similar, even the muzzle, all right, and of course, the defense mechanism of the needles or the spines, and they are unrelated. The only thing they have in relation is that they're placental mammals, but their phylogenetic tree is totally divergent because this porcupine developed in North America and this one in Africa after Gondwana land and after the spirit of the continents, okay? So this is another example of uh, convergent evolution. And it happens in plants too. So not only animals, but plants. And this is where I want to talk a little bit about the true pines and the Australian pine, because we have the Australian pine locally in Miami and in the Caribbean, and it's a pest. It's, excuse me, it's invasive, it's not a pine, and that's why I have it in quotations, but it is from Australia. And it's actually a deciduous tree. It's a deciduous tree, it's an angiosperm. It's a flowering tree. It's not a conifer, okay? But the Australian pine and true conifers have developed similar structures by convergent or parallel evolution. So first, starting with the overall shape of the tree, which is kind of triangular, it's kind of a cone, um, what do you call this? Yeah, cone, generally, the overall shape. Then, you see how the conifer has two cones. They have these woody structures, 
And these are compound flowers or their woody structures. You can see them sometimes when they're in bloom, the Australian pine, if you have seen Australian pines around, right? Uh, you'll see these woody structures that look like little cones. I, I didn't find any today, but I should gather some at some point. They have these little woody cones. They look like cones, but they're actual flowers. In, in other words, inside each one of these cones, this is the fruiting body. Inside one of these, there's, there's a flower, which eventually develops into the fruit. This is the fruit. And as it continues to ripen, it becomes hard, woody, okay? Even the seeds are very similar because they're airborne seeds. The little seeds of the Australian pine are very similar in structure than a true pine because the seeds of a true pine are also airborne. They look like little wings. So they have parallel structures in the shape of the tree, in the reproductive organ, in the leaves and the, and the needles that I'm gonna show you in a minute, and even in the leaves, in the uh, seeds, okay? But when we look at the actual so-called needles, let me show you here, I have some real needles because we have the true pine, the candy slash pine, I'm passing this around, right? Some are double, triple, but that's a true needle. That's an actual needle of a pine tree. It's long, it's a single structure, and at the base, it may be united by a little sheath, uh, two or three needles. Typically, pine trees have one, two, or three needles. And um, at the base, they will be united with a little sheet. But you see, a needle is a single structure, right? Uh, let me pull up here a square and not uh, slash pine. This around, they can slash pine which is unique to this area. It has uh, adapted to survive in our environment. And it's actually a conifer that has adapted to a subtropical environment. Emma? Um, no, this is a silly question, but it's kind of like a hair follicle. Yeah. Um, oh, the shaft there? Yeah, functionally equivalent. It's functionally equivalent. In other words, it holds, that shaft holds together the appendage, as it were, which is the needle itself. Just as far as holding it together, then the hair follicle itself is much more complex than that. It's got little muscles and nerves and other, and sweat glands associated with it, okay? No. Once the needle falls off, it will not grow back, all right? Yeah. Okay, so uh, the, this uh, slash pine is unique and has adapted, even though it's a conifer, it has adapted to a subtropical environment. Okay, and very well adapted. So well adapted that it is truly the dominant species of this community. They're slow growing. They take 100 to 150 years to grow, to get that big. And, and we happen to have this forest here, which is just beautiful because it's an urban forest right in the middle of a residential area and part of this area is also commercial. It's even got an airport nearby. It's got an expressway next to it. So we're very, very fond of the forest. Okay, so this is a true pine conifer, pine tree. Now look at the so-called needle of the Australian pine, which are not needles at all. They have you notice that it's not a single structure. First thing we notice is that it's segmented. It's actually segmented. All right. And the reason why it's segmented is because each one of those segments is like a twig. It's like a little twig. That's why I have it here enlarged. And the actual leaves are collapsed against the twig. And there could be anywhere between seven to 12 of these little leaflets collapsed up against the twig very tightly. So that the most that one can see 
is the little brown tips that they curl out like this, all right? And even here, this one, you can barely see a little kind of creamy color. You can break it and you'll see there's like a little crown there at the break. On the top, it's like a little crown. Those are the tips of the leaflets, all right? Those are the actual tips. Break off one of those segments and you see those little tips there. All right, so what's my point? This is my point. The Australian pine is not a real pine. It's not a conifer, it's an angiosperm, it's a flowering plant, and it doesn't have needles at all. It has leaves, little leaflets, that have collapsed up against the twig, and then the twigs are lined up, so the branch is a, sequence of twigs that make up for what looks like what looks like a needle but it's not a needle at all okay and so why functionally all we see is the structure and the structure looks very similar so that's kind of that's parallel evolution okay? however why are those leaflets then collapsed like that so tiny and so small against the twig well, you would have to know further, just one more hint, that um, what is on the outside surface of the twig is the outside of the leaf. It's the top part of the leaf, all right? It's the top part of the leaf. The inner part of the, of the inside of the leaf or the underside of the leaf is what's underneath, is what's against the twig, is the underside of the leaf. So think of a normal leaf. There's a top part and a bottom part, right? Okay, the top part, is has an extra layer of a cuticle that protects that leaf from the environment and especially it's a waxy cuticle it protects it from dehydration but the underside of the leaf has little structures called stomata and the stomata are little holes on the underside of the leaf that allow it to breathe so they are the functional equivalent of nostrils <laughs> okay let me move this guy out of the way for a moment and uh, leaf stomata, one stoma, several stomata. Again, the Latin. See, it's on the, on the underside of the leaf at the microscopic level. Embedded on the underside of the leaf are these little holes that are called stomata one stoma, several stomata. And they actually are lined up with two cells on the side, they're called guard cells. And those cells open or close, open or close. And they're actually allowing the plant, the, the leaf to breathe because the leaf is photosynthesizing, right? So the leaf, needs, the leaf needs to absorb CO2 from the environment. That's why it's a functional equivalent to the nose, but the function is reversed. In other words, it allows CO2 to come in but then it's trying to conserve water so it doesn't dehydrate because there's water vapor, it's a production, it's a byproduct of uh, cellular respiration. And so the, the leaf would dehydrate, you know, if it's not conserving its water. So the stomata are a gate to allow CO2 to come in and also to allow O2 to leave but also to retain water, to retain water as much as water vapor, okay? All right, so those stomata are always on the underside of the leaf in a normal plant. In the Australian plant, pine, since I'm telling you that the underside is up against the twig, this is a drastic measurement for holding on to water to prevent desiccation, dehydration. Now we go to Australia where these things are native and we see that the Australian pine is growing. So Australia is a huge island and it has greenery around the edge, but then the center of Australia is mostly one huge desert. It's very dry, the center. Okay, that happens a lot in islands and the center is very dry. And so these Pine trees, or these Australian pines, Casuarina is the actual name, have adapted to be at the edge 
pushing into the desert. They're the ones that are most adapted to a dehydrated, to a dry environment. And the drastic adaptation is this leaflet uh, issue with the, with the uh, so-called needles, and also the woody, the woody uh, flower also prevents desiccation, prevents dehydration. All right, it's not very tender, that would tend to dehydrate easily. The flower is very woody, it's a woody structure. Let me see if I can find this the aerial photograph. No, I need actually I need Google here. <coughs> Why is it so small? Let's see. No, that's not gonna do it. I can do this. Uh, where is size, 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 size? Oh, plus. Yes. Okay. So see how Australia is mostly green around the edges, but the center is one big desert. Okay. And so this is, uh, this casuarina is an extreme adaptation to those harsh environmental conditions. Australian pine. And I bring it up because it's invasive here. There are several species, I think there are about six species of casuarina, highly invasive in South Florida and the Caribbean. And it's actually competing with, for us, with the slash pine, with the native slash pine. Because at a parallel evolution, it has similar structures. Okay, so they, they can outcompete the slash pine. Why? Because they grow much faster, being deciduous, and being in their environment, say, where the, the, pine, the, the slash pine would have an advantage if it snowed here, right? Because the casuarina is not going to tolerate snow. See, but because it doesn't snow, now the uh, slash pine is at a disadvantage. And this is an invasive species. This Australian pine is an invasive species that has come into South Florida and it's becoming a monoculture. It's taking over large areas and it's very hard to eradicate because it also uh, reproduces by vegetative propagation underneath and tends to colonize new areas very fast. Whereas the good old slash pine did not have any native enemies like that early on when it adapted, so it's used to growing slowly. Mm -hmm. And it's a big problem. The Australian pine is a big problem, but it's important to know the basic biology and the fact that it developed by parallel evolution. Mm -hmm. But now here in South Florida, it has an advantage because it's humid, there's no snow, it's a warm climate, everything that the pine, that this, that the casuarina needs for flourishing. Okay? So it's very big on the, on the, uh, on the invasive list of the, uh, um, of the plants. Okay, but there's another example then, a drastic example of a parallel evolution, right? We can see the eye also. The eye has developed multiple times in evolution from simple eye spots, like in the planaria, for example, which are only able to tell light and darkness between light and dark, okay? These are just eye spots to Multiple single eyes, this is a clam. These are single eyes, multiple of them, dozens of single eyes on the edge of the shell. To a compound eye in uh, insects in general, it's a fly eye, compound. This looks like a mosaic. Each one of these uh, segments 
is part of a picture. It's like looking through a grid, okay? And each cell on the grid is one of these. So the brain has to compose that together. This is known as a compound eye. We don't have a compound eye. We have a single eye, but it's not simple at all. It's extremely complex and it can detect a range of colors in what we call the visible spectrum from just from the ultraviolet to the infrared. It's a variety, it's a whole range of colors, what we call the, uh, the spectrum or the, uh, the rainbow. Mm -hmm. And it's a very complex structure. And these eyes, these different types of eyes have developed independently dozens of times in various different classes and species in, in evolutionary time, independently of each other. So it's not that our eye developed from the simple eye of the planaria or that the compound eye of uh, flies developed from the multiple single eyes of the clan. No, these are very uh, unrelated species you know, the, the phylogeny on these, the common ancestry of, of these four species here is way back millions and millions of years ago with a common ancestor that had no eyes. <laughs> and in the divergence, some of those species developed eyes, uh, some then later lost their eyes, typically when they go into an environment that doesn't have light, uh, like in caves. You have arthropods, you have you have uh, um, crabs, you have uh, shrimp that are eyeless. That's a further adaptation that lost an organ that uh, had no, there was no use. But you also have vertebrates. You have fish that are eyeless that live in caves. Okay, it's a secondary, it's a very specific adaptation because there was no use for it. So it was selected out. <laughs> That's it, okay. So the point here being that something as uh, sophisticated as an eye has evolved, has emerged in evolutionary time, dozens of times in many different unrelated species, and yet functionally, essentially the same function, which is to detect light and different wavelengths of light. Mm -hmm. So we see that convergence then can occur at the structural level, at the functional level, at the behavioral level. Ultimately, that convergence uh, is going to be at the biochemical level, right, with pathways. And what do you think then, what's your intuition, what is driving convergent evolution? You have species that are very, that are unrelated or very distantly related, that live in geographical regions that are worlds apart from each other. So there's no direct contact between these species. But what's your intuition? They're gonna have a similar what? Well, the common, no, but the common ancestor is a distant common ancestor, okay? What they have is a similar habitat, a similar climate, right? Similar climate, similar environment. So they have developed several structures to deal with that climate. Or well, that climate has selected similar structures in order to allow those plants and animals to live in those similar environments that are very, very far apart from each other. So if you think about it, the emergence of convergent evolution, of convergence, it's another, uh, it's another proof that evolution has occurred after divergence, there has been a convergence. Again, in structures, functions, and behaviors because of similar environments, right? And so we see adaptedness. We see adaptedness, but we only see adaptedness after the fact. We don't see it happening because it's happened already. And that's what he means by a posteriori. We only see it after the fact, but we see then that they are adapted. They're not perfectly adapted, 
but they are on average the best adapted for this particular climate at this time. Okay, I think uh, that's it. Yeah, so now we're going to, uh, this is uh, the end, projecting a little forward. We only have uh, three more lectures. So next lecture, now we're going to focus on the human, all right? And we're going to go away from Meyer now, which is more general evolution. You may continue to read it if you want. Uh, also, but this is a loner, so at some point I need it back before, by, by the first week of December, okay? Uh, you may continue to read it if you want. You can also, if you want to keep it as a reference, uh, to me it's one of the best, if not the best book for understanding evolution as a whole. Uh, you can buy it online, you get online and, and you buy them just like this uh, for three, four dollars. Mm. But I always keep a stock for the, for the next class, okay? And now we're going to go to human evolution, finally, after setting the basis and being able to understand what really evolution is and what is not evolution. Okay, because part of the problem of the controversy between religion and science and creation and evolution and all this is that a lot of people think of what is not evolution. For example, Lamarckian and things like that. Okay? or some kind of magic going on. None of that, it's all very mechanical, it's biochemical, it's driven by chance and opportunity, but if it works, then it sticks. <laughs> Until it doesn't work anymore, then it's gonna be selected out. It's very functional, very, very pragmatic, if you will. All right, so now we're gonna go for the next uh, three lectures, we're gonna go into human evolution, because we're looking at phylogenetics, the origin, ultimately, the origin of the human species as a whole, all right? But also being respectful to our belief, and so next lecture will be mostly on the early part of human evolution as such, the anthropological evidence, and then the last two lectures, integrating the, uh, our Catholic beliefs, our religious beliefs, and specifically the book of Genesis, the first five chapters of the book of Genesis on the story of creation, the narrative of creation. Okay, so that's when we hopefully will complete this theological anthropology of the species as a whole. Mm -hmm. The phylogeny, that's what I mean by the phylogeny of humans, where do we come from and how do we become human in contrast with our Cross relatives, which are non humans. <laughs> All right, so that's coming up. I, I don't have, um, it's only um, a couple of chapters from a book. Uh, I'll send you the link if you want, but I'll provide you the handouts for the book so there's no actual reading for next class. Uh, uh, well, I'll tell you what, I'll send you the notes that I have so you can do a little reading beforehand, but it's not going to be. You can read the part, the human evolution in Meyer if you want, but I have another textbook that is more up to date on the, on the anthropological evidence and the fossil record, especially the fossil record. Okay, so if uh, there are no questions then, I'm going to end it here. And let me stop recording. Any questions for Roberto, you're okay? Yes? Okay, I don't know. Yes. Okay, so I'm going to close the session and then send you uh, the link. Stop recording. Bye-bye, everybody.